Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. How many of you were blessed by those videos? Amen. Guys, I'm going to encourage you to go to awmi.net and go to the stories, go to our healing journeys, our financial stories. We've even been talking about starting the resurrection journeys because there's been so many people raised from the dead by Karis graduates. So there is so many things that God is doing using ordinary people because God's an extraordinary God. Amen. So I encourage you, please, and thank you, Stephen, and the teams for capturing those and inspiring so many people because we've seen people come in and say, when I saw the healing journey of, and they mention an individual, that's when faith was birthed in their heart and said, if God can do that for them, God can do that for me. So I encourage you guys to go and check those out. Amen. We'd like to say a big thank you to Andrew and to Miss Jamie as well for allowing us this opportunity to share with you all. Um, it truly is a blessing for us to be here. You know, we feel like that we're standing in the presence of giants Amen. with uh, all that has been accomplished. And I, I wish that we had time to go into the, the details of everything that's happening throughout the ministry. You know, uh, AWM and Karis are, are in uh, 20 different nations. We have 19 different AWM offices, 52 different Karis locations spread throughout the world, not including this location. And if we were to take the time to share everything that's happening all over the world, truly, we would not have enough time during this conference to share with you all the different healing journeys as Carrie was sharing. We just had a, a gentleman raised from the dead in Uganda and we're, uh, we're capturing his story even as we speak. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're planning on bringing that back there to show all of our partners everything that they've been able to accomplish on a global scale. So it really and truly is amazing what the Lord's doing. And I know that the, the uh, news media um, if, if you want to call them that, uh, they're painting a very different picture, but I'll tell you something, God is very much at work in the world today. Amen. And we're seeing some awesome things happening all over the world. And so don't believe the lies of the enemy. Don't be discouraged. I believe that when God saw this time frame specifically, he chose you and I to be alive because he knew that he was already going to put the answer on the inside of us. And we are going to be able to bring transformation to this world, not because we're so good, but because he's so good. Amen. And so we're excited about this, uh, all that's happening in the world and all that the Lord is doing. So I believe that God is stirring up things even in your heart, because sometimes it's really easy to think that you're ordinary. Like, well, I'm just ordinary. Like, I can't do something like that through me. But this isn't about you, is it? Praise God. Amen. Praise God. It's not about you and I. Praise God. It's about the spirit of almighty God living within us. And if that's where we can keep looking to, then all of that power, all of that supernatural, then it's destined to flow through us because that's why Christ died. Amen. And so that he could live through us so that we could truly be the light and salt in the world. And the enemy's whole goal is to keep your eyes off who you are in the spirit and make it about the flesh, make it about the natural, make it about everything that's happening in our lives so that we continue to stay in a spot where we think that we're ordinary. And so we want to share something with you this morning. And uh, the message is called, well, it's a long title, Stop Whining and Complaining, which leads to frustration, anxiety, peer depression, and self-centeredness. <laughs> Mike thought we should title it, Do You Want Some Cheese With Your Wine? Because here's the deal, is that we understand, and, and I'm not, we're not putting anything, we're not putting down any situation that is happening in this room. And I know there are a lot of situations. There's health situations, there's family situations, there's financial situations, there's different things that you are going on a journey of. But we can choose how we view it and how we let it affect us. And so many times we look at this whole, when we look, think of the scripture, where does our help come from? And we know that answer, the answer comes from the Lord, that our help comes from the Lord. So what we want to talk about today is where does our wine come from? Where does our wine come from? You know, we all have the opportunity to go by the old wine or by the new wine. You know, the uh -huh. old wine is all about focusing on the world. It's all about focusing on... Uh, what we see happening in the news today, how, how this group is pushing it back against this group and all these different things, and these laws are being passed that are ungodly. Or we can focus on the new wine, the, the solution to the problem, what God has placed on the inside of us. You know, I, 
How many people were here yesterday to hear Richard Harris's presentation? Wasn't that amazing? You know, as I was listening to what he was sharing, I thought to myself, praise God our founding fathers were not looking at the problem, they were looking at the solution. Praise God that they were not so overwhelmed. He talked about the, the solemn atmosphere in the room as they were going up and signing and how some people felt that they were signing their deaths, their death warrants. I thought, praise God, that did not stop them from doing what they knew was right to do. And that's the amazing thing about what Carrie was just sharing about our focus, is that we truly have the ability to get our eyes off of the circumstances and get them onto the solution, the, the Word of God, what He has declared over our lives, and that this can truly propel us into the vision, the destiny, the calling, the victory that God has called each and every single one of us to walk in. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday and, uh, who's, who's very near and dear and speaks into our heart. And uh, something came out of me that I wasn't even planning on saying. And so he, he's a true mentor to Carrie and I. And I said to him, I said, you know something? You're not called to make my life easy. You're called to make my life better. And that's the thing about the Word of God. It's not called to bring ease into our lives. It's called to make our lives better. It's called to, get, to empower us, to truly equip us to overcome any situation in this life. You know, you know Andrew has mentioned a couple times that, you know, that, we're gonna re, that we will get persecutions in this world. And uh, you know, we even began to chuckle at it a, n- a number of times as he was sharing it. But the, that's, that's a promise from the Lord. And I'll tell you something, I wouldn't want to be, have acceptance with the world. I wouldn't want the world to say, hey, you're doing a great job. I would rather have Jesus telling me I'm doing a great job. I'd rather please him and, and, than anybody else in this world. I'd rather be focused so much on him that other people call me weird and strange than call me normal and have their, their conduct be the measure of normal. And I think that's where we have to come to in our lives is truly getting our eyes off of the things that are happening around us and back onto the word of God, what he's declared over us. And I'll say that this is the thing about situations, and this is one of the goals, is while the enemy's trying to make us feel normal, he's trying to capture us in the situations that all of us have. And every single one of us has different types of situations. But the thing is, is that the, what the enemy does is he tries to let those situations or, or tell us those situations have a voice in our life. That those things... And that voice is trying to give you direction, is trying to bring emotion to the table, and it's pri- trying to bring you conclusions. Well, obviously, this is going to turn out and it's going to look like this and this and this, right? And so situations can try to tell you who you are and what's going to happen. And that's easy to get caught up in this world. I mean, that's, that's why the, the Bible talks about how we're not supposed to walk according to this world. That's why when you look over here in Psalms chapter one, right, he constantly is letting us know that there's things that are happening in the world. He says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So there is an opportunity for all of us in these situations just to walk the normal path, right? Just to to sit down and take the counsel, to sit down and get the consultations that the world is saying, this is what your story is going to be. This is what the health report has to, is obviously going to end, end up in or result in. This is what your financial destiny is going to look like. And they can push all the papers and all the scans and all the blood work and all of the court cases and they can push it all before you and say, this is what you have to accept. But praise God, we do not have to accept that. Amen? That is not our destiny. That's not what we're called to. And so that's why when the word of God talks about this, even in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, he says, He said, be careful that you're not taken captive by this world's philosophies, right? The systems of thinking that rest on basic human tradition rather than on Christ. And this is, this is, and I'll just say there's so many of you, you're representing families here. You've got teenagers, you've got kids here, and you get an opportunity. Are you going to live as a family, live in your marriage as Pastor Greg was talking this morning, right? You'll always remember that message because he quoted messages about breasts, right? You're going to remember it. You're going to remember this Summer Family Bible Conference, right? 
God has a way of planting things in your memories. Thank you, Pastor Greg. No, come on, guys. There's things you are raising your family. You are building your marriage. There's all these dynamics that are happening, and we can choose the world's way of just what is normal. And it's easy to choose what is normal because you think you're normal. It's easy to accept those reports because you don't see yourself as anything bigger or deserving more. And that's why when we come here, we're reminding ourselves of, no, we have relationship with Almighty God. And He lives within us. So nothing is impossible. We don't have to receive what's pushed across towards us from the table of any doctor or banker or politician or family member and say, that's what I have to accept. Amen? Amen. See, whenever the world tries to give you its own mentalities or a circumstance comes in to try to to formulate how you think, those always come with boundaries. They always come with borders. They always try to force you into a particular situation saying, oh, your only recourse is to do this. This, It's very limiting. The amazing thing about the word of God that Carrie is just sharing is it's it's very liberating. It actually empowers you to think out of the box. You know, the the word of God, it says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, we all know this, this scripture very well. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us mm-hmm. we understand the power that works in us it's liberating it'll set us free we start dreaming bigger we start we stop thinking about what is the world telling me are my, are my, are my limitations we start saying okay what is the word declared over me what can i do if you have your bibles if you can open your open your bible to first peter chapter two this is something i've been med- meditating on for a little while and uh just looking at this it's, it's so powerful and it's, it's something that's it's so, so apparent. Sometimes you ever read the word and you're just like, well, duh, I should have known that. I do that all the time. Um, First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And uh, that word peculiar actually means extraordinary. That you should show forth the praises of who, him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, what that tells me right there is that what the world, when the world is trying to put its ideologies, its mentalities upon it, upon you and I, it's from a place of darkness. Have you guys ever tried to do anything in the dark before? How many people got up this morning and it was still dark out and you tried to maybe take a drink of water or tried to find your way through a doorway and you end up crashing into the doorway, you end up smacking your head or doing something, doing something tripping over the dog or... And then you try to kick the dog and you kick the bed and it just doesn't work out very well because it's dark. And that's the thing. That's what we need to, to, to remember is that these mentalities that the world is trying to share with us, they're formulated in darkness. They're formulated from, from in, in a perspective that's skewed. They don't, they don't see clearly. And when we buy into the mentalities of the world, when we say, yes, I'm going to do it just like the world, we blend in with darkness, first of all, but then we also don't have a real understanding of what reality looks like. It says that you and I have been called out of his darkness into his marvelous light. How many people like operating in a light better than operating in the darkness? Amen. It's, so, it's clear. You know exactly. I know that in the light that this is a red pen. In the darkness, I may be able to feel my way around and eventually discover it's a pen, but it takes me a little bit while. It's skewed. It, it, it's, it's, it's obstructed my view, my understanding. When light comes in, it brings clarity. And when we come into the kingdom of his, the, 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 his marvelous light, I'll tell you something, it truly shows us what life is supposed to be like. You know, Carrie talked about how we have the same spirit living on the inside of us as Jesus had. Jesus was an exact representation of what our life is supposed to look like as well. Because it was based out of the light of his his marvelous kingdom. You know, when when he, he dealt with, the way that he dealt with sickness should be the exact same way you and I deal with sickness. The way that he dealt with uh, depression should be the exact way that you and I deal with depression. The way that he dealt with the world and its mentalities, we should be doing the same thing. You know, and, and I'm, I'm, this is not condemnation. This is exciting because if we've been taken captive by the world, if, we're, if our mentalities are currently in a place of darkness, this tells us that we have an avenue in which we can advance and we can walk in the victory that Christ Jesus has called us to walk in. Amen? This is exciting news. 
We don't have to be blind. We don't have to be the blind leading the blind. We can, we can walk in the light that Christ Jesus has called us to walk in. It was interesting when we were talking about this. Mike said this, and I loved how he said it. He says, peculiar, where the reason we're called peculiar is because decisions that we're making are not based off of darkness. So then when people look at you, they're like, why? Wait, wait, that doesn't make sense. Why are you doing it that way? Well, I thought the doctor said to do it this way. I thought the banker said you're supposed to do it this way. I'm your mama, you're supposed to do it that way, right? And you can have people that are, are questioning, like, why are you doing this? Why are you, why are you not concerned about this? Are you not taking this seriously, right? But what we're being peculiar because what? Our hope is not in the situation, amen? Our hope is in what the word of God is saying. And we're saying, you know what, even the, the cares of this world can try to invade, but I'm going to tell those cares of the world, no, my relationship with God is stronger. And this is why when we look at everyday life, and this is why you'll hear us talk so much about this, about relationship with God, because relationship with God is not this, you know, something you have attached to your life. It's supposed to be your whole life. Because if it's not your whole life, then the cares of this world truly begin to be the thing that you wake up and you do every morning. You do the cares of this life. And many times those cares, it looks like work and it looks like family and it looks like marriage and it looks like all the other things of this world. But what we've done is we've exalted them above our relationship with God. And because we've exalted them above our relationship with God, then they have the ability to take us captive. Now we get caught up in just how we respond to the cares of this world based on the way the world says to take care of them. And God's calling us to a new way, a peculiar way that you respond differently to everything in your life. Amen. And there are sections of your life that you are standing, you're believing, and then there's other portions of your life, and if you're honest today, you'll say this, there's other parts of your life that look just like the world. You're just handling it and thinking about it and kind of avoiding it just like the world does versus going after it with the word of God. And you know what I love? And this scripture, I want to read this scripture out of Luke chapter 21, verse 34. This is when Jesus was talking to them about the end times and when he was coming. And he says this in Luke chapter 21, verse 4, 34, he says this, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and cares of this life and that day come to you unexpectedly. And I was reading that and I thought it was so interesting. He put carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life all together. But you think about carousing, right? And you think about drunkenness where you're just like, you don't really have a clear view of anything. You're like, whatever. There's just such a carelessness about how you're viewing things. There's no, there's no true understanding or clarity. Well, that's, he puts cares of this world right alongside drunkenness. That the cares of this world have the ability to cause you not to have clarity. To cause you just to be kind of wandering around like, what am I doing? I don't know, I'm just doing my thing. Have you ever ran across a drunk person? Have you ever been drunk in the room? No, we don't have to talk about that today. But what happens is it's kind of like they're stumbling around, whatever, right? We lived in Russia, so we were... It, what's that? It's like you're in the dark. Yeah, like you're in the dark. Amen. So there's this dynamic of you just whatever, and you can't think clearly. Whatever happens to you, happens to you. In the same way, the cares of this life, if we do not give them over to the Lord, they have the same effect on us. They can just kind of lead us in whatever direction the situation is going, and then we just stumble after whatever is happening in our lives. And cares of this world are not supposed to be the leader in your life. The leadership of our life is supposed to be the word of God and our relationship with God. When Andrew is talking about leadership, oh, my earring fell out, praise God. I'm less anointed now, obviously. <laughs> when Andrew was talking about leadership the other day and talking about us being able to lead because of relationship with God, that's one of the key things we have to do is who's gonna lead our lives? Is it gonna be the word or is it gonna be the situations? And that's the thing that that's, I mean, you, you think about it, the leadership that Andrew was talking about, that's supernatural leadership. That's the leadership based out of relationship with God. What Pastor Greg was sharing earlier today, that's a marriage based upon the principles of the word of God. 
that should be what we're experiencing continuously. And, and again, there's no condemnation there. We're all growing through that process. Mm -hmm. But every aspect of our life should look different from the world. The world looks at us and, man, and says, man, you're strange. We should be looking at them and say, and say man, you're really strange. You're absolutely, in, you're out of your mind. Why are you living this way? Why are you living a self-centered life? Don't you know that you're going to die? Don't you know that you have a finite end? Why in the world would you only live for yourself? Going back to what Carrie was sharing there in verse number 21, in verse, uh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 21, in verse number 33 of the scripture prior to it, this is a powerful scripture. It says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. How many people like investing in things that are going to fail? Guys, this world system is going to fail. Sooner or later, it's going to fail. That's right. But the kingdom that God is establishing will never fail. It will have no end. So we have the opportunity in our lifetime. I mean, I think it's such an incredible gift that God would empower us to invest our immortality into, I'm sorry, our mortality into immortality to invest our efforts while we're here in this world to truly impact eternity. And we can do that starting in our own lives and then impacting the lives of the people that are around us. What an incredible gift that he's given us. But oftentimes, what the enemy's gonna, gonna try to do, Carrie said in the very beginning, every single attack of the enemy, it's meant to distract you. It's meant to get your attention off of who you are in the spirit, off of all the great and precious promises that are declared over us in the word of, word of God, that 2 Peter chapter 1 says that we actually become partakers of his divine nature. But the distraction of the enemy is to get our attention off of that, get our focus off of that, get our focus onto ourself, because he understands that in ourselves, we're powerless to stand against us, against him. But praise God, God didn't leave us weaponless. He didn't leave us defenseless. He gave us his word. He gave us his spirit, his ability. And all it takes for us is just change our attention, change our focus. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 talks about not being conformed to this world, but to be transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind. Transformation comes as we renew our mind, as we're no longer focused on the things of this world, where the, the normality of this world becomes insanity to us, and the normality of the Word of God becomes our lifestyle. Where that truly becomes the way we live, it becomes our heart's breath. It become, we, we, we couldn't imagine a day, a moment going, out, going outside of our relationship with God. We couldn't imagine a relationship that's not built around the structure of how God first defines it. So my, my, my relationship with my wife is not what, what does the world define as marriage? Because ha they have some crazy definitions of marriage right now. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the world didn't create marriage, so therefore the world should never define marriage. All right? God defined marriage, amen. God defined marriage as between, being a man, as between a man and a woman. And that's what marriage is. That's it. And so understanding that, that's how I relate to my wife. That's, I relate to my children the way that the, the word of God dictates a father should treat his son and his daughter. Mm -hmm. And the, these, these becomes our, become our normal operating procedures every single day of our lives. When we look at the word of God, you know that I love the word of God because when we talk about it taking leadership within our lives, how many of you have ever had this massive headache? Oh, the sore neck, the back. And it goes on for like hours and hours. And then you think, oh, I guess I should pray about that. Has that ever happened to you? Or you get a week into a situation, you get five hours, maybe five months into an eternal fight with your spouse. And then you realize, oh, I should bring this to the Lord. How many times is it kind of the last thought? Can you be honest and say sometimes that happens? And you're like, oh, I should ask the Lord. This is what the beauty of relationship with God and the word is within our hearts. So when things rise up, the Spirit of God is able to bring back to our remembrance the Word of the Lord. And that's why this lifestyle of the Word, that's why we're so committed to teaching the Word and discipling the Word here, right? To, through the live streams, through the conferences, through Karis Bible College, through Karis Live Bible Study, through Andrew's television show, we have to get the Word into our hearts, don't we? We have to lay that as a foundation so that when situations come, we're not scurrying and scrambling or crouching in a corner going, I can't believe this happened to me. Why does the bad things always happen to me? And we start whining and complaining. 
And then you look at your other Christian friends and you start whining and complaining. And it's, it's time to start, stop whining because God is so much bigger than our situations. And please understand our hearts today. We're not coming from this place that we never have any issues or we never have any difficulties or there's never been any attacks. But in that moment, you have to decide, are you going to stop whining and complaining or are you going to respond with gratefulness? Stephen said, it was amazing, Stephen's testimony. How do you respond when persecution comes? How do you respond when the enemy's trying to steal, kill, and destroy? Well, you respond knowing that the enemy has been defeated. You get to respond saying, no, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Hey, you get to respond and say, my situations do not have to be a voice in my life. And that's why when we look in the word of God, it gives some commands. Can I give you some of those scriptures? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, cast your cares on the Lord. See, so many times we're, we, we hold our cares and we're trying to nurture them and we're trying to figure them out and we're trying to resolve them with our own intellect or with our own agenda or we, we definitely have a plan for how it should play out and so then therefore we're holding those cares to ourselves and he says, cast them upon me. See, that's when you're giving the word of the Lord. You're giving God leadership. Lord, I trust you, so I give all my care because, Lord, you do care for me. Amen? There's cares today that you're holding on to that keep waking you up in the night, that you keep thinking about. Even as we were talking about these things, Mike and I were talking about these, we were praying about these things this morning. There was a care, a particular care of the ministry that came up in my heart today. Now, I would... The first thing I think of, well, no, it should be important to me. I'm, I'm a leader. I should be trying to help serve Andrew and Jamie and resolve this problem and look at it and figure it out and bring solutions. And I'm sitting there, and the more I'm sitting there thinking about it, the more aggravated I'm becoming. Amen. Not, not, for and, not against Andrew and Jamie, but at this situation, right? I'm thinking, okay, how do we, because I'm trying to figure out how to solve it in my own strength. And then the Lord's like, can I can remind you of the, the, the sermon you're going to teach today? <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I just cast this upon you. I think you have such wisdom and such clarity. I give this to you, Father. I just thank you. I don't have to worry because you're going to give us wisdom and it's going to be for your glory. Amen. Guys, there's things that sometimes you feel responsible for. You feel passionate about but what we do is because we feel responsible and because we feel passionate, we keep those cares in territory where we can't truly solve them. It's only in releasing them and giving to the Lord that the true solutions and the supernatural miracles begin to happen. You look at Proverbs chapter, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now, I'm, I'm praying about that. I'm not there yet. Uh, my, goal, my goal is for my initial reaction to go back to the Word of God. And I have great successes sometimes, but I also have great failures sometimes. But the reality is that that's, that's what we should be training ourselves up to, that I don't lean on my own understanding. I'm not going to just take my experience as the final rule. I'm going to go back to the Lord and say, Lord, what do you say about this situation? You know, my natural senses would tell me to do this. I'll just, just do this, just, just do that. I mean, but what is God speaking over that situation? Amen. It goes on to say, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. I'll tell you something. Is there anybody there yet where in all your ways you're acknowledging the Lord? Well, this is a call. This is a, what an amazing opportunity this is. Mm -hmm. Because you think about the end of that verse. He, what a promise from God. He shall direct your path. So if in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. That's, you can take that to the bank. If you will acknowledge God in everything, every single thing that you do, he will absolutely guide you and lead you in every aspect of your life. Amen. What an incredible blessing. We should be looking at that going, Lord, challenge accepted. I'm going to take this. this. This now belongs to me. And I'll tell you something, as we do that more and more, the cares of this world, they just, they, just, they just fall away because you realize they're not my cares anymore. They're the Lord's cares. Because if he's going to truly direct my path in everything that I'm doing, he has to figure out this way. He's, he, he told me to do it. And I love what Andrew says about the building of this campus and what we're, everything that's happening here. God didn't ask him to pay for it. Just ask him to believe for it. So... 
let, let's, let's take that as a word for each and every single one of us. If God has put something in your heart to do, to be, to grow into, to, to assist with, God didn't ask you to figure out how to do it. He just said to trust him in all your ways and don't lean on your own understanding. Amen. Truly allow him to be God in your life. Allow God to be your default. You start doing that, I'll tell you, we'll start walking in the victory that God has called us to walk into. You know, we always say this with Karis Bible College, with the students coming in, we said, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. And I don't say that flippantly, but I mean, you can just have a simplicity of heart. Like, God, if you told me to do it, then all that you're asking of me is obedience and trust. See, so many times we're trying to figure things out and we're praying and we're asking God, heal me, deliver me, get me out of debt, fix my family, change my husband. You know, we got all these prayers that we're praying. Or wife. You said husband. I said husband. Right? You got to have these prayers that you're praying, right? It's somebody else's husband. And... <laughs> You got these prayers, and, but at the same time, you're still trying to do it in your own strength. You're still trying to do it in your own effort. You still got your own agenda at the same time. And God didn't ask you to pray about it and then take it back and deal with it in your own hands. So this is what happens. We're doing this yo-yo. Lord, I give it to you, and I take it back, right? And I throw it up to you. Have you ever tried to do that yo-yo one where you do it up, and then it comes back, and it knocks you in the head? Sound familiar? Or we throw something up to God, but then we yank it back down trying to figure out how to do it in our own strength. And again, there's part of you that feels like, but it is my problem, it is my life, I need to figure it out. But this is where that true, absolute Lord, you are better, you are bigger, you see farther, you know the future, you're the alpha and the omega. And so, Lord, you formed and fashioned me, so you only have good things, so I give it to you. And you just chuck it up to him. And then you just get to say, okay, Lord, now, whatever you tell me to do, now it becomes obedience. See, we want God, we're asking God to bless our efforts versus saying, Lord, how do I be obedient? What do you want me to do? Then when God does ask you to do something, and this is, this is where works and religion and grace, so many times people don't know how to, how to do this. And I had a friend ask me the other day, she said, okay, how do I follow the things that God's telling me to do? I feel like I'm supposed to do something. Like, what do I need to do to get to that place that God has for me? And I told her, it's not about you doing to get to that place that then God can use you. It's about you seek him and he shows you, then out of obedience, that's when you start moving. But now it's out of obedience, not out of works, trying to get God to do something. Amen? So there is gonna be change. There is gonna be things that need to transform in your life. There is gonna be things you need to set your hand to, but now it's out of the strength and grace of obedience versus you trying to do your own thing for God to bless it. Completely different way. And so then we're saying, okay, God, what is the word of obedience that you have for me and what is the step I need to take? So if that is, okay, now I need to go home and I need to serve my spouse. I need to go home and I need to apologize to someone. I need to go home and I need to quit my job because God told me a year ago to quit and I have been disobedient. There's things that once you get into that place of obedience, God starts speaking to you things and then he gives you the grace to obey. That's how you start seeing the peculiar things happen. People are like, what? You forgave them? You shouldn't forgive them. Now you're operating out of obedience and now there's anointing and testimony because of your obedience. Amen. You know, and the thing that's amazing about this is that this is just not meant for you and I. Our, the success that we're called to live in through obedience is not just meant to be our success. It's meant to, it's meant to inspire the other people that are around us as well. It's meant to challenge other people to grow in their relationship with God. Do you ever read in Hebrews chapter 11? You know, we call that the, the faith hall of fame all the different names of the different people, you know, if you, it, it, as you scroll through, if you can turn there really quickly, this is, this is very much worth the time and the effort. You go, you see these names of these people who accomplished incredible things. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, uh, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, uh, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, 
David, Samuel, all these incredible people, whenever you think of these people in their name, you think of success. You think of them overcoming. You don't think of their, their, their failures. You just think of their successes. And what's incredible is that the Bible says that we're actually surrounded by these, this great crowd of, cloud of witnesses who are watching us. And guys, these are people who dared to believe. And then we can look back at their example and we can say, you know something? If God, through David, killed a giant, I can do the same thing. Because I have, I have a better covenant than what David had. It, whatever these people did before in the past, they can just, and it's awesome to consider them. But as you keep on reading here in Hebrews chapter 12 now, you go down to, to verse two, we have the epic example. We have the chieftain example we can possibly get to in verse number two. It says this, now, now we consider all these other people, but we look unto Jesus. We look unto him and everything that he was able to accomplish. And this verse, just, I wish we had time to really unpack it. It's so chock full of just incredible, incredible revelation. It says, looking unto Jesus, the, the beginner, the beginning, the author, and the finisher of our faith. The one who, whatever he started in our lives, if we'll keep trusting in him, he'll bring it to completion. He will bring it to completion. Is there a part that we have to play? Yes, we trust him and we walk in obedience, but he brings it to completion. He gives us supernatural wisdom, supernatural understanding on how we're to accomplish these things. Now, let me just ask you a question before we keep on reading. What do you think was the most challenging time in the life of Jesus? Probably when he went to the cross. Probably, you know, you think about that, his, the, the, the fact that he sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and what he was about to go through and the fact that he was about to do something that none of us would ever have to do ever again if we receive Jesus into our heart and that's be separated from the Father. Take upon himself our sin, our sicknesses, our, our weaknesses and give us his righteousness. Like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It goes, but it, this is what it goes on to say. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What an, what an incredibly powerful statement. Most of the time, I'll speak for myself, in the past, when I would used to encounter opposition, difficult times, circumstances, I would let those difficult times or circumstances dictate to me what my next steps could possibly be. What I, I'd, even worse yet, I would let them stop me. But you know what Jesus saw as, saw as the, the, what he, how he looked at the cross, how he looked at the shame? He looked at it as a means to an end. He looked at it, he said, he, he said that this, this, is not, this is not what I want to do, but you know something, this is the will of God for me. And this is what I'm going to do. And because of it, I'm going to reap the reward of what God's going to give to me. And that's you and I, relationship with him. And if we'll consider that same thing, if we'll look at every single obstacle, every single circumstance, every single situation as a means to an end, God didn't cause it. We understand that. Stephen was very clear about that. We read Romans chapter eight, verse eight, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. We understand that God didn't cause these things. We do understand that God can utilize them and we can grow. And we, we will receive healing because Jesus healed, he already healed us 2,000 years ago. We will receive joy. We will receive peace because Jesus already gave them to us. We, we received them when we received him into our hearts. And we look at the, whatever situation comes our way as a means to an end, and understanding that we already have the victory. Why? Because we're trusting in him. We're not leaning on our own understanding. We're casting all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. And he has called us to walk in victory. You know, when we look at, the, again, the leadership of the word and we're letting the word tell us how to respond to the situations, to the doctor's reports, to the family issues, to the things that you, you're touching with your hands, you're holding in your arms. You look at those things and say, Lord, what do I do? And instead of keep looking at yourself to fix the problems, we're running to him. And that's why his word says, cast your cares upon the Lord. That's why in Psalms 4610, be still and know that I am God. Right? That's why he says, do not be anxious about anything in Philippians chapter 4, Verse six, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, give it to God. See, he's, he's giving us leadership in his word, saying, hey, all of these emotions, all of the situations, all of the things that are difficult right now, would you bring them to me? And so many people have a hard time bringing things to the Lord 
because they don't really know him. And this is why when we talk about relationship with God, you can't talk about intimacy with God if you don't know who he is. That's why one of the foundational things in this ministry that is constantly taught is the true nature of God, the goodness of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the healing power, who he is as our healer and who he is as the provider and the nature of God. When you know who your God is, well then yes, you're gonna cast your cares upon him because you know he is way bigger and he has got so much better than you could ever plan. If you could imagine the highest and the best, God says, I wanna do immeasurably above that. That's awesome. That's why when Mike read that earlier in Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, he says, I want to do immeasurably above all that you could ask, think, or imagine. The problem is that many of us only have an imagination and think like the world. Amen? And because we think like the world, Right? We're never able to get into that whole area of the spirit of God within us. So when we start putting this word inside of us, it's a consistent thing. And I'll tell you right now, moms and dads, you have a generation. Your generation is in those other rooms. And they need you to think different. They need you to be peculiar. They need to hear faith come out of you because it's not just about you. It's about your generations and your grandkids and your great grandkids that are in that other room. And it's time to start fighting, not just to have victory in your life. You want to fight to display a lifestyle of victory over the enemy no matter what comes your way. So your kids and your grandkids and the people in your life and your neighbors can see victory in you. Because it's supposed to not just be something that we're casting upon the Lord. Everybody else sees us casting it upon the Lord. Amen. Because you're not worried, you're not whining, you're not complaining, you're not moaning, you're not saying, I'm sick today, how sick are you today? Oh my goodness, isn't it amazing when people get sick and you get a whole bunch of sick people around each other, it's like a competition of who's sicker. <laughs> really, you're on that medicine? Oh, I'm, they've got me on, a, they've got me on prednisone at like 5%, right? Oh my goodness, in Russia, they would just argue. Well, no, I'm sicker. No, the doctor said I'm dying. No, I'm worse dying. It's like, stop arguing about your death. <laughs> People need to hear your victory. They need to hear your faith because you're saying, I've given this to the Lord. I don't know how it's gonna work out, but it's gonna be awesome. Just you watch and see. You gotta start prophesying your victory because you are speaking the word over your situations. Amen. And your kids and your grandkids, they need to see that. They're waiting because they're, they're, they're surrounded by a lot of horrible stuff. They're seeing and being exposed to different things, friends, other people, right? There's a lot of stuff happening in the world and they can see you and see joy and peace and hope. Amen. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter three and verse two, um, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth and he says, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So picture there's a book and it has your name written across the book. When your coworkers pick up that book, what are they reading about? Oh, amen. When your family pick up, pick up that book, what are they reading about? And again, guys, this is, what an incredible opportunity because at the author of our book has an amazing story that he wants to tell for you and I. You know, Stephen just talked about all the stories that are coming out of here and Jesus is the best storyteller ever. He's absolutely incredible. And according to Psalms 139, all of our days were written in his book before we ever lived one. Mm, amen. And now through our actions, through our obedience, we can bring into life the pages that he has written down on our books. And as, as other people read them, they can read about the miraculous. They, we can settle for a normal life. We can settle for blending in. Like Carrie said, what is that telling our future generations? You know, the Bible says, that the word says that a, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Well, when your grandchildren think about you, what will they remember? What are the thoughts that, that will pop to their mind? Are they like, man, he was nuts. He loved Jesus. He was incredible. <laughs> I hope so. I hope that's it with how people look at me. Is that, man, he just, he didn't, he didn't live life like everybody else. Amen. He, wasn't, he wasn't conformed to this world. 
He, he lit, you ever hear somebody talk to, when they talk about somebody, how they, they, they dance to the beat of their own drum? Amen. That should be all of us as believers. We should be dancing to the beat, to the beat of a different drum, one drum by Jesus, with his word as our priorities, with his word as our focus, not being sick when the rest of the world is sick, not being depressed when the rest of the world is, de- is being depressed, not being taken captive by the lies and not believing everything the world is, is saying to us, but by, but by going contrary. You know, Jesus talked about how, when, I believe it was in, uh, I have it written down here, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 31, he talks about the end times. And he talks about when, the, when people say that I'm here, people say that I'm there, and these things start happening. He said, he said don't believe them. Don't believe the world. Don't believe their, their concepts. Don't believe their opinions. Don't believe that the way that they, they see this world. Many of us as believers, we fall into the place where if the news says it, we believe it. It should be the place where if the word of God says it, I believe it. Nothing else matters to me. That's, that's my plumb line. That's how I judge everything else by in this world. And when we get to that place, we start walking peculiar. We walk, start walking extraordinary. We start walking abnormally. And we start drawing attention to us so that we can give attention back to the Lord. And the world is getting crazier and weirder and bolder. And so that means your stance of choosing the word is going to seem weirder and crazier and bolder. Amen? The Bible talks about how in the end times things will get darker and darker, but we shall shine ever brighter. But that doesn't mean just because you're a believer, just because you have Jesus in your heart, you're going to automatically shine brighter. It's a decision that when situations and cares of this world and just the stress of life comes, you're able to run to Jesus each and every time. Because there's hundreds of more scriptures we could share with you. I have pages more that we didn't get to today. But no matter what you're going through today, can I say this, that the Lord already has prepared your victory. He's already got your healing. There's already answers. There's already testimonies. There's inheritance that has already been given to you for what you are going through right now. And not only has he prepared them, he's excited about it when you walk in them. He gets glory. He, 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 he can't wait for you to discover all the amazing things that he has in store for you. Amen. All the blessings that he wants to bestow upon you. Let me read this really quick. In Psalms 27, in verse 4, it says this. We're in a couple of verses. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This dynamic of this becomes our desire. This becomes our pursuit. It says in verse five, for in the day of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon the rock. When trouble comes, you know exactly where your strength is. You know exactly what your fortress is. You don't let fear and worry and anxiousness and depression come over you. You don't go leave doctor's reports. You don't leave banks. You don't leave a family reunion all tied up in knots and frustrated. Amen? Because you know where your help comes from. And this is in verse um, 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. And then he says this. When you said, meaning God said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. This is the decision you get to make today. You get to seek either the answers of this world, the emotions of your own heart, the counsel of others, or you get to seek the Lord. And that's what he wants to remind and stir up today of seek him because he wants to what? Show you great and mighty things which you have not known. So can you believe that God's got some mighty things for your situations? Amen. Let me ask again. Do you believe that God has some mighty things planned for your situations? You need to praise him on this side of the victory, knowing you already have it. You may not see all of the manifestation yet, but you start declaring it and knowing that it's yours today. So can we pray and close? And we are going to hand some things to the Lord today. Go ahead and stand. And we have prayer ministers that are available after because we want to agree with you.
We've prayed with different people. We've heard some of the different situations and stories and things that are happening within your life. And I'm telling you today, God has already given you the victory. There are promises and words and things he's speaking to you today. I think there's things that he's going to continue to speak during this conference. You're looking for answers. You're looking for a rhema word. God has it. So keep your heart open. But let's praise the Lord. So whatever situation you're going through, whatever thing that you're believing God for, let's first take it to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry for leaning on my own understanding. I'm sorry I've let anxiousness, I'm sorry I've taken this care and been trying to solve it and do it in my own strength. And Lord, because you love me today, I know that you care for me and I give it to you. And as we pray, give it to the Lord. If there's something you've been leaning on your own understanding with, This is your opportunity to say, I stop leaning on me. I stop leaning on the way I want it to look and what I think should be done. And Lord, I trust in you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Right now, uh, for everybody, I just want you to imagine the situation or whatever it is that you're holding on to in your own strength. Just imagine that in your life. Lord, you see these things in our hearts. And right now, Father, we we just cast these cares upon you. Amen. Lord, our hands are too small. Our strength is too weak. We, we can't do it in our own strength. We know, Lord, that you are more than capable of handling any situation. So we just give you this situation right now, Father. And we just commit, Father, that every time we have a temptation to take it back, we're going to turn that back over to you. Amen. We love you, Father. We thank you that you care for the things that we care about. That you have anointed us, Father, to be your vessels in this world. Not to be distracted by the lies of the enemy or the distractions of the enemy. And not to be taken captive, but to walk in victory as an example and as a light in this world. We love you so much, Father. We thank you for all the victory you've already won for us. Lord, you're just incredible. We we just choose right now, Father, that your word will be the standard in our lives. Hallelujah. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Bring these things back to our remembrance. We love you. We bless you. We give you praise for being the answer and our victory in these situations. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'll give him a shout of glory. Amen. God is greater than anything the enemy's been trying to throw our way. Amen.